Hello, everyone, and welcome to season two, episode 10 of Arbin Brief. My name is Natalie Bradze. I'm counsel at Hogan Lovells, and I'm one of the founders of Arbin Brief. I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Maybe a few words about Arbin Brief. It is a practical video guide on handpicked arbitration issues, showcasing talented and diverse arbitrators in an interview format. Arbin Brief is produced in collaboration with Delos Dispute Resolution and Era Pledge, and season two is sponsored by Lalib. In today's episode, we will be discussing the ways of dealing with, uh, dis uh, with uh, default in arbitration proceedings from an arbitrator's perspective. I am extremely happy that today on International Women's Day, we have two brilliant speakers um, who actually need no introduction, but of course I will introduce them anyway. Bunke Adekoya, an independent arbitrator with over 40 years of experience in arbitration, and Neve Leinbata, Secretary General of the Vienna International Arbitration Center. Thank you so much, Funke and Neve, for agreeing to join the final episode of season two. Um, with this introduction, I will just jump directly into the discussion. And let us start with some general topics to set the scene. Funke, um, what do we mean when discussing uh, default in arbitration proceedings? What types of situations of defaults can you envisage? Um, thanks, Nata. Uh, default comes in two forms. It could be defaults by the parties. Uh, claimant files its request for arbitration. The respondent does not reply. It could come defaults by the arbitrators. One of a panel of three doesn't participate. But usually default is by the parties. Starting with the first one, you file, a, you file your notice. The other side doesn't do anything. And then we're obviously stuck unless the rules provide for what happens. And in this case, the Delos rules does provide that the failure to file a response does not stop the arbitration from proceeding. So you, you need to look at the rules if you're an arbitrator and you have yourself in that position. Thank you so much. Neve. Um, if the respondent decides not to respond, and, and Funke just referred to the Delos rules, does arbitral tribunal generally have the authority to proceed with the arbitration on an ex parte basis? Thanks, Nata. Um, yes, I think it's generally recognized by arbitration rules and um, laws that a party cannot, um, by its absence, um, railroad or frustrate the proceedings. Um, Funk already mentioned Article 4.5 of the Delos rules that um, provides that the proceedings will, will continue. Also, the, the Vienna rules provide that a um, an arbitration proceeding cannot be um, obstructed by the fact that a um, party doesn't participate. There are, of course, other um, parts of the um, proceeding where a, default, a party might default, for example, if they fail to participate in the constitution of the arbitral tribunal. Um, of course, all rules like Delos or the Vienna rules um, provide for um, a procedure in those scenarios. So Article 11 of the Delos rules and Article 17 of the Vienna rules. Um, another classic defaulting um, position for a party is to fail to um, pay in advance on costs. <clears throat> and the Delos rules and the um, Vienna rules specifically um, provide for usually that the claimant will then pay the advance on costs. Thank you, Neve, for this great overview also into the Delos rules and the VIAC rules. Um, now, jumping into a more detailed discussion on the default proceedings, and, and we all know that the, one of the main risks of the default proceedings is setting aside of the arbitral award. Funke, if I may start with you, um, uh, in case of a having a defaulting party, what should an arbitrator do to decrease the chance of an arbitral award being set aside? Well, uh, um... I think the responsibility is both on the arbitrator or arbitrators and on the council that is proceeding to document all the efforts made to ensure that the defaulting party is aware of the proceedings, has been served with all the processes, and has just decided not to participate. If it were for, um, if I were the arbitrator, I would ensure that if I sent out emails, I would click for 
reply requested or delivery requested so that you have a record to indicate that the party was served and did receive notice of all the proceedings. And I would assume that council will do the same. And it will then be reflected in the award. Thank you, Funke. Neve, do you have anything to add? I think that was exactly my question. You would then attach all this to an award to make sure to decrease the chance of setting aside, right? Yes, exactly. So I think, like Funke said, the most important um, the most important step for an arbitrator to take is to make sure that there is proper notice, also for counsel if it's an ad hoc um, arbitration. And I think the issue or the problem for a sole arbitrator or a tribunal is, is that as it is that fine line, that balance between ensuring that the parties um that you're you're giving them the opportunity to present their case, um, but that you're also pursuing a, an efficient arbitration proceeding. You don't want it to be unnecessarily delayed because of maybe tactics on the defaulting party side. But you also, of course, the main overall aim is to establish the truth um, and render an award that is sound in law and in fact. So it's the, the balancing act, I guess, for the arbitrator to make sure that they cover all of those bases. Thank you. And, and Eve, you just mentioned notices. Um, how often and by what method would you, I, I think uh, Funke just earlier also said, um, request delivery uh, if it's sent by email. So what deadlines would you give and how often would you expect that the, the notification on the development of the arbitration is given to, to the parties? I think from a practical point of view, it, it is worthwhile for the arbitrators to be potentially a little bit more generous with the deadlines that they're giving if they know that the party is defaulting. Um, from a council perspective, I, I think a council have or opposing council have the an ongoing obligation to continuously check if the addresses that they are using, the postal addresses, are the accurate addresses whether they do that by looking in the commercial register or looking in um, you know, available sources, or maybe they even want to um, engage local council in the specific country or a detective to establish where um, the defaulting party is, is located. And um, so I think there is that ongoing obligation to make sure that, that you're um, that you're trying to, to access the defaulting party at the correct address. Um, and just to be a little bit more pragmatic and, and generous with your deadlines. Thank you, Niamh. Funke, um, is there anything you wanted to add on this point? Um, the only thing that I would like to add is that um, sometimes when parties default, they do it as a delay tactic. And in such instances, one should not be overly generous such that you do not then put the participating party at, at a risk of having a delayed hearing. You do have situations, and I have encountered situations, where you have a party who has defaulted from the beginning, and then a couple of days before the hearing pops up and then says, well, um, I'd now like to participate and I would like X amount of time to, be, to enable me file my processes. And even though the arbitrators, as Neve said, have to balance the right to a party to have an opportunity to fully present its case, it still has to ensure that it is there, it's not um, adversely affecting the party who has participated. So you just need to possibly give a little bit more time to allow the defaulting party to come in at the last minute, but not such that they've actually achieved the objective of derailing the processes by coming in just before the hearing and saying, but well, we now want to defend. Um, thank you, Funke, but what, what if this kind of situation actually happens and a party does reappear right before a hearing? I don't know if you've had, any of you have had an experience this happening. What do you do as an arbitrator? Well, I, I'd speak from my personal experience because it has happened. Uh, defaulting party appeared a week before the hearing and then said, well, we'd like three months to enable us file our processes and participate in the hearing. And the panel took the view that you've been served with all the processes right from the beginning. And so you're not going to get the three months that you're going to ask for, but we would extend time by four weeks. And so we eventually actually just like move the timetable by three weeks to enable them participate. 
that was probably one of those lucky situations where all three of you had the possibility of just shifting it by three weeks because practically that might be harder. Um, just moving maybe to another a point of establishing facts, if you don't have one of the parties participate, um, tribunals, of course, should be maybe more proactive in establishing facts, but how do you do that practically, um, considering the obligation to, to act impartially um, to both parties? Uh, Neve, um, Funke, whichever would like to take first. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good question because it's all, you know, like everything with the defaulting party, it's a balancing act and it's a fine line. Um, you know, the burden of proof will, will always be on the claimant. Um, but if we look at the rules, for example, the, the Vienna rules um, in Article 29, they give the arbitral tribunal upon its own initiative the discretion to collect evidence, to question um, parties or witnesses, to request the parties to submit evidence uh, and to call experts. And the Delos rules also in Article 4C um, for, give the, the arbitral tribunal quite an active role um, and, and a discretion in that, in that regard. So I think it's important not to advocate for um, the defaulting party, um, but I think it is important to address maybe issues where you feel if there was a party um, actually participating, they, um, they would maybe potentially raise these issues. And jurisdiction, I guess, is one of those obvious ones that I think if you're, um, if you're acting in a um, arbitration where the the defaulting party doesn't participate from the get-go, that the arbitral tribunal should certainly look at jurisdiction ex officio, um, because that might actually, you know, you might run into problems with your award at a later stage. Thank you, Neve. Uh, Funke? Um, I think he's actually covered it all. I think the most important thing would be is to look at the jurisdictional point ensure that you do have jurisdiction. If there are any doubts, ask to be addressed on the issue of jurisdiction. Otherwise, for common law countries, it's the balance of probabilities. The, the party who is participating should still have the burden of putting its case forward and proving its case. Thank you. And, and maybe just one last question, because we are, we're discussing establishing the facts, would this apply also to a hearing where you just have one participating party? How practically, how, how do you um, conduct yourself as a, as a tribunal when you only have one party and witnesses and, and experts just one, from one side? Um, I, I, th I think Neve has mentioned the fine line that an arbitrator has to do. To, to balance, you cannot become counsel for the defaulting party, but you should uh, at the same time be able to ensure that the issues that need to be raised to satisfy yourself as the arbitrator, that the case has been clearly put, are put forward. Um, maybe just a final word on the hearing, sorry, Nata, is, you know, in, in these situations, if there are no, um, witnesses to be heard or no experts to be heard. You know, I think it's completely acceptable to have a written proceedings only or document only um, proceedings. And if the non-defaulting party is happy with that, I think that is probably the most efficient way to, to go about dealing with this question. Thank you so much. Um, we've covered a lot of questions already. And, and I think this brings as to an end of this episode. Thank you again, Funke and Neve, for the excellent discussion, for agreeing to speak on our final um, episode of season two. Um, before finishing, however, we would like to thank our partner organizations, um, Delos and Aeropledge, and as well as all the regional organizations that have supported this episode. Um, Delos is an independent institution established in 2014. Era Pledge, for those who don't know, establishes concrete and actionable steps to increase the number of women appointed as arbitrators with the ultimate goal of parity. Um, the sponsor for season two is La Lieve, an international law firm with offices in Zurich, Geneva, and London, of course, renowned for its expertise in dispute resolution. To see future Arbin Brief videos on handpicked arbitration issues, please follow us on LinkedIn, visit our YouTube channel and the newest Spotify podcast that we have launched a couple of weeks ago. Um, we would like to, of course, hear your comments and feedback. And um, for um, the next season three, we will, of course, be making um, additional posts. With this, we finish our season two. 
Um, and we thank you all who attended this live session.